In today's presentation, we will continue to take a look back at some baseball history as presented on U.S. postage stamps. In this fourth part of our series, we focus on the stamps issued after the year 2000 and their history. Stay tuned after the end of this presentation for a bonus show of my personal baseball covers and memorabilia. Most players only get a hit 25% of the time, a batting average of 250. The ball players honored on the baseball slugger stamps in 2006 all have higher batting averages than that. Roy Campanella, 276, Hank Greenberg, 313, Melot, 304, and Mickey Mantle, 298. Philadelphia native Roy Campanella was a catcher in the American Negro Leagues and Major League Baseball. Campanella signed a Brooklyn Dodgers contract in 1946. A smart and skilled catcher, he was also impressive at bat. He averaged more than 85 runs batted in per year over the course of his career. Campanella played every All-Star game from 1949 to 1956 and was in five World Series. In 1969, he was the second African-American player inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. After a car accident in 1958, Roy Campanella was paralyzed from the chest down and confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Henry Benjamin Greenberg, baseball's first Jewish superstar, was born in New York. A powerful slugger, Greenberg earned the nickname Hammer and Hank. Even though he had only nine full seasons, he had a career total of 331 home runs and averaged more than 141 runs batted in per year played. Greenberg was the first American League player to enlist after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The 34-year-old war hero returned in 1945 and hit a home run in his first game back. Hank Greenberg played in four World Series and on five All-Star teams. Melvin Thomas Ott was born in Gretna, Louisiana. At 16, he joined a semi-pro team near New Orleans and was an immediate sensation. The owner sent him to Giants manager John McGraw. At 19 years old, he became the New York Giants regular right fielder and was outstanding in that position. Ott stayed with the Giants 22 seasons, playing in three World Series. He was an all-star every year from 1934 to 1945. When he retired, he had 511 career home runs, the first National Leaguer to hit 500. He averaged more than 80 runs batted in per year. Ott also held the National League career record in bases on balls, mostly because pitchers grew wary of him early in his career. Mickey Mantle hit 536 home runs and averaged 83 runs batted in per year over the course of his career. His father named him in honor of baseball great Mickey Cochran and taught him to hit right and left-handed. As a teenager in Oklahoma, Mantle developed great strength from summers working in the lead mines and doing farm chores. That strength enabled him to hit long home runs. In 1960, he hit a ball against the Detroit Tigers that was estimated to have gone 643 feet. Mantle played 18 years for the New York Yankees. He was in 16 All-Star Games and 7 World Series. On May 2, 1908, Take Me Out to the Ball Game was submitted to the U.S. Copyright Office. Neither of the men involved in its creation had ever seen a baseball game. The song was a hit. It was the top song in the country for seven weeks and became the most popular song of the year. The song's female point of view made it popular with women, who bought the sheet music to play on the piano. In spite of the song's popularity, it was more than 20 years before it was ever sung at a baseball game. The first known instance of the song being performed at a baseball field was during a high school game in Los Angeles in 1934. Later that year, it was also played during the fourth game of the World Series. Then in the 1970s, Chicago White Sox announcer Harry Carey and owner Bill Veck made the song a baseball tradition. Veck suggested that Carey sing the song over the loudspeaker and now the song is the anthem of the seventh inning stretch in nearly every major and minor league baseball park. 
baseball was in its infancy when the rule known as the Gentleman's Agreement banned black players from white leagues. From behind this color line a new American pastime was born, Negro Leagues Baseball. Rube Foster, considered by historians to have been perhaps the best African-American pitcher of the first decade of the 1900s, also founded and managed the Chicago American Giants, one of the most successful black baseball teams of the pre-integration era. Most notably, he organized the Negro National League, the first long-lasting professional league for African-American ballplayers, which operated from 1920 to 1931. He is known as the father of black baseball. The first Negro Leagues were formed in 1920, and fans were treated to a fast-paced game filled with action and flamboyance. Players like Satchel Paige electrified the crowds with their showmanship. A tall, lanky right-hander, Page often told the outfielders to sit down while he struck out the next batter. And Cole Papa Bell would often try to steal two bases on one pitch. Integration came in 1947, which had mixed results. Black players had finally gained equality when they signed with major league teams. But the Negro Leagues lost their best players, and attendance dropped. At the end of the 1961 season, the era of Negro Leagues baseball was over. The great poet Walt Whitman is widely credited with saying, I see great things in baseball. It's our game, the American game. Whitman's prediction proved true, as America's love of baseball turned it into the national pastime. Now, our love affair is so deep that the game's biggest stars can rise to become national heroes. In 2012, the U.S. Postal Service honored four players whose drive for greatness transcended feats of skill. Although the official city of issue was Cooperstown, New York, Special cancels for first day of issue covers were developed for the cities where the players spent their careers. The greatest baseball players of the past and present gathered in Boston for the 1999 Major League Baseball All-Star Game. Before the game, an old man in a golf cart rode out to the field. Superstars and Hall of Famers gathered around him, bouncing like puppies, asking for autographs, all seeking their personal moment with former Boston Red Sox great Ted Williams. Williams ranks among the all-time great hitters, 521 home runs, 2,654 hits, a 344 batting average, 2,021 walks, and 1,839 runs batted in. The legendary numbers were all the more remarkable for the five seasons lost to military service in World War II and the Korean War. Even his wartime duty was the stuff of legends, as a fighter pilot, he was wingman for future astronaut John Glenn. Williams had a difficult relationship with both fans and journalists, never acknowledging their cheers or boos. In 1960, in the last at-bat of his final game, he hit a home run into the bullpen. The fans roared, urging him to come out. Author John Updike wrote, Though we thumped, wept, and chanted, he did not come back. Gods do not answer letters. But in 1999, Ted Williams' Teddy Ball Game, the splendid splinter, the kid, tipped his cap to the adoring crowd. During the fourth game of the 1948 World Series, the Cleveland Indians and Boston Braves were locked in a pitcher's duel. Boston star pitcher Johnny Sane was pitching to a Cleveland outfielder named Larry Doby, who drove the ball 420 feet for a home run. This would prove to be the game winner. As the Indians celebrated in the clubhouse after the game, a photographer snapped a picture of Doby and winning pitcher Steve Gromek hugging cheek to cheek in sheer joy, with ear-to-ear -ear grins. The picture appeared in major newspapers across the country. It caused a stir. Doby, a black man, had not even been allowed to play in the major leagues two years earlier. Now, he and his white teammate were instant symbols of America's changing views on race. Doby was just 24 years old at the time. He followed Jackie Robinson as the second black player in baseball, Doby was first in the American League. He would go on to play in seven All-Star games and was elected to the Hall of Fame. Years later, Doby was hired as manager of the Chicago White Sox. One of his players had been born in Cleveland in 1950, and was named Larry Doby Johnson, after the man who was now his manager. 
the 1979 Pittsburgh Pirates were struggling early in the baseball season. Team captain Willie Stargell insisted they adopt as their theme the song We're Family. The Pirates caught fire, and Stargell led the way. They called him Pops. He was 39 years old, and became the oldest player to win the Most Valuable Player Award. Early in his career, Stargell was a productive player and occasional all-star, but not quite realizing his potential. It wasn't until the Pirates moved out of gigantic Forbes Field and into a new, normal-sized ballpark in 1970 that Stargell's power really shone through. He was big and burly, a menacing figure in the batter's box. He didn't just hit a lot of home runs, 475 in all, he hit them far, great titanic blasts. One opposing pitcher remarked, he doesn't just hit pitchers. He takes their dignity. In the years following his career, Stargell struggled with kidney problems that sapped him of his mammoth strength. The Pirates honored him for his contributions to the team and he was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. On April 9, 2001, the Pirates opened a brand new ballpark, complete with a Willie Stargell statue out front. He never saw it, having died earlier that morning. Joseph Paul DiMaggio was born on November 25, 1914, in Martinez, California. The sixth of seven children born to Italian immigrants, DiMaggio was named after his father's favorite saint, St. Paul. DiMaggio's father, as well as several generations of his family, were all fishermen, and his father hoped all of his sons would follow suit. However, DiMaggio hated the work and the smell of fish and worked odd jobs instead. DiMaggio dropped out of high school to work and eventually joined a semi-professional baseball team. His older brother Vince played for the San Francisco Seals and convinced his manager to let Joe fill in at shortstop. He then made his professional debut on October 1, 1932. The following season he had a 61-game hitting streak that was a league record and the second longest in all of minor league history. DiMaggio later recalled, Baseball didn't really get into my blood until I knocked off that hitting streak. Getting it daily hit became more important to me than eating, drinking, or sleeping. Joe DiMaggio holds the MLB record with a streak of 56 consecutive games in 1941 which began on May 15 and ended July 17. DiMaggio hit 408 during his streak, with 15 home runs and 55 runs batted in. The USPS issued the Have a Ball. Stamps on June 14, 2017. The paint of 16 featuring 8 different designs, with a special coating, applied only to selected areas. This gives the stamps a textured feel. Trivia question, how many stitches does a regulation baseball have? The answer is included in our bonus presentation. DiMaggio hit 408 during his streak, with 15 home runs and 55 runs batted in. In today's presentation, we took a look back at some baseball history as presented on U.S. postage stamps issued after 2000. Thank you for your interest in the video. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, ring the bell, and you will be notified when new videos are released. Next up, a bonus show, my personal baseball covers and memorabilia. My first Major League Baseball game was during the summer of 1971, and I was able to see Hank Aaron and Willie Mays play in the same game. Fast forward 25 years later, and I found myself working with Gail Aaron, his daughter. I hand-carried two copies of Sports Illustrated for her to take to her father for his signature, and this is one of the magazine covers he signed. We won tickets in a lottery to be able to attend this game. My high school history teacher drove me and two friends from Greenville, South Carolina to Atlanta, Georgia, to see this game. Highlights included seeing Reggie Jackson miss an easy catch while flirting with women in the stands, and the best highlight of all, seeing Hank Aaron hit a home run to tie the game in the ninth inning, two years before he would break Babe Ruth's career record. Cookie Rojas clutched two-run home run in the eighth inning gave the American League a 3-2 lead going into the ninth. However, the National League once again worked its magic, tying things up in the ninth with Aaron's crowd-pleasing blast, 
and then winning the game in the 10th on an RBI single by Joe Morgan. It marked the NL's ninth win over a 10-year span. Of course we did not know as we watched the game, that 18 of those players on the field would be elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in later years. On this unique cover, the cachet is cut out and mounted on the envelope. Hammering Hank would break the Babes record in Fulton County Stadium in Atlanta. Although the stadium was torn down in later years, the base paths remain outlined in the parking lot today, along with an X to mark the spot where the ball landed. Mr. Aaron refused to sign this cover, and returned it to me in perfect condition. I didn't fully understand this until I watched a Turner Broadcasting System documentary in the late 1990s that revealed the racial ordeal that he endured in his pursuit of one of baseball's long-standing records. Many people believe that Ken Griffey Jr. would be the one to break Hank Aaron's home run record over time. Injuries took their toll on the superstar and he finished his career with 630 home runs. After moving to Atlanta in 1982, I was privileged to watch Phil Necro pitch many times. On days when his knuckleball was working, he was nearly unhittable. Bob Buecher gave the best description of how to catch a knuckleball, wait until it stops rolling and pick it up. Steve Carlton was another great pitcher I watched on many occasions. The Philadelphia Phillies teams he played on were so terrible that in some seasons he won a third of their games for the year. The first time I saw Frank Robinson play he was part of the 1966 Baltimore Orioles championship team. He would go on to become Major League Baseball's first black manager with the Cleveland Indians. Charlie Huff had a 24-year career with four different teams throwing the knuckleball. I have some great memories of working with Dave Parker and his wife Kelly. They operated a franchise restaurant in Cincinnati. They are some of the nicest people I have ever met. I remember reading a Sports Illustrated article where Dave was described as looking like a school bus pulling up to the plate when the Pirates debuted their all-yellow uniforms. This regulation baseball has 108 double stitches, or 216 individual stitches. After working with him for several years, I finally had the nerve to ask for his autograph, which he gladly provided. As he handed the ball back to me, I thought of his throws during the 1979 All-Star game from the outfield, and what a powerful arm he possessed. A few years later I took this photograph to present to him. I was elated that he liked it enough to display it on his office wall. I remember my shock in hearing the news that Dave had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2012. Dave and Kelly have a long history of always giving back to the community. Shortly after his diagnosis, Dave and Kelly organized the Dave Parker 39 Foundation, which is a non-profit organization focused on finding a cure for Parkinson's disease in our lifetime, and to make life better for those living with the disease today. Let's make tomorrow better than today. Please visit the site and get involved. Thank you for staying through the bonus material presentation.